I'm going to be talking about the regulatory leadership function that uh, this directorate has, this new directorate has. And I think before, in order to uh, explain a little bit about it, I think it's probably worth just looking at our new strategy. Um, and uh, you, this, you may be familiar with this, um, but there are a number of key key elements to our strategy. Uh, well, first of all, people and communities. We want to be uh, seeing things uh, through the eyes of uh, the public through the eyes of communities. We want to be focused on those and, and making sure that we're getting feedback and what we're doing is relevant to people and communities. Uh, we want to be um, a smarter regulator. We want to have strong, supportive, uh, constructive relationships with services and, and ongoing conversations about uh, quality. Uh, and we want to make it easier for um, for services and organisations to give us the information that we need uh, and make it really easy uh, using technology, uh, make it easier for for services to update that information um, so that we, uh, we we can have uh, uh, more 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 easily running conversations with with organizations safety through learning we want to uh, promote uh, do everything we can do to promote the culture of safety the culture of learning uh, we want to um, help staff feel very confident that they uh, they can uh, they can raise concerns they can uh, um, help their organizations learn uh, what is safer practice and, and implement that practice. And we want to be accelerating improvement, of course. We want to be um, uh, helping organisations with their, with their continuous improvement journey uh, and have collaborative improvement conversations uh, with, with organisations and, and, and others who are involved in the improvement space. Running through all of it, of course, there are two, two, um, two, two essential themes. Um, one that we are we know that we're dealing now with health and care systems and and organizations are working uh, together more across those systems and collaborating uh, through integrated care systems we want to be um, working well with those systems and and that that approach and also we want to be doing what we can do to help um, ensure that inequalities the pervasive um, inequalities that still uh, still um, uh, 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 trouble us are, are being reduced and being attended to the, the as, as well as we can so in, you know in a nutshell that's our new strategy and um, if I go to uh, now where we to the next slide thanks Steph to um, what regulatory leadership does you'll 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 see that the 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 task of reg regulatory leadership team is is really congruent with the strategy in terms of helping making sure that that strategy um, comes into being so we'll be working uh, to deliver those strategic ambitions by um, helping set operational priorities for the CQC uh, we'll be uh, testing uh, new ways of working uh, within our, our own organization and of course working with systems and working with with uh, with organizations uh, provider organizations we'll be using our independent voice to inf influence the health and social care system you'll be familiar with our state of care report uh, and uh, and others and we'll be doing um, thematic pieces of work uh, which um, have often uh, landed very well in the system and have, have been um, very uh, significant pieces of work helping uh, change attitudes and change um, change perception of of various uh, um, uh, uh, ways in which organisations uh, deliver healthcare. We want to also improve uh, influence improvement initiatives, and uh, of course prepare to deliver our new powers um, next year for local authority and integrated care system assessment. So that's what we're attempting to to do uh, as a as a regulatory leadership team. Um, if I have the next slide, we're we're sort of going from uh, a, a a sort of structure that you, you that you might be familiar with, chief inspector of adult social care with deputy chief inspectors, uh, chief inspector of hospitals with the same, and chief inspector of primary medical services integration, going from that kind of setup, which as you can see, sort of. Um, would lend itself to the development of silos perhaps, but we want to go to what's on the next slide, which is a an integrated um, regula regulatory leadership function, uh, working much better together uh, um, uh, and then linking well 
with our operations group led by the executive director of operations um, and having a, 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 a constant and constructive and productive uh, workflow across those two groups. So I think that's um, all I was going to say about uh, about regulatory leadership function. And I think I'm now going to introduce um, uh, Mary, uh, one of our one of my colleagues, Mary. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Cridge and I was delighted this year to be appointed to the role as Director of Adult Social Care um, and to be part of the regulatory leadership team that we are talking to you about this afternoon. Um, I've been in regulation for a long time. I've stayed in it so long because I know when we do this well, we really make a difference to people both working in a service and using those services. Um, on the slide in front of you is uh, something of my mission statement. Um, so priorities at the moment for me, it feels like a time like no other for adult social care with so much reform and so much higher profile for it. I really want to capitalise on that and I want to really help change a bit of the dialogue and ensure that adult social care and what that services can contribute to the overall system and to the lives and well-being of people is really well understood um, and that we get that positive positive voice for change. Um, I'm also with my team starting to look at how we're working with services for people living with dementia making sure we're as good as we can be at regulating those and being part of the national debate. We're awaiting uh, a new dementia strategy from government, but uh, so we're doing lots of uh, thinking about that as well. So I'm delighted to be part of this team and the ability for us as individual directors to join up and be truly integrated is a, is a it is just wonderful. I'm really enjoying it and I hope you'll uh, be seeing and feeling the difference. Handing over now. I don't think Manny is with us this evening, so I'm going to introduce Manny, Dr. Manny Hussain, who is our Director of Primary and Community Care. Manny is a clinical pharmacist um, by professional background. Manny has also worked, though, in primary care commissioning, uh, where he led on medicines, community services and, and general practice. Good afternoon, colleagues. Really good to, uh, to see you this afternoon. My name is Victoria Valens and I am Director of Secondary and Specialist Healthcare uh, with the regulatory leadership function as, as has just been described. I've had a variety of wonderful roles in my uh, last 10 years with Care Quality Commission, but prior to that, uh, I'm still uh, committed to my role as a nurse. And I started out as a children's nurse, community specialist practitioner in both acute settings and community settings and then worked uh, for a couple of years in commissioning before I joined uh, CQC to undertake regulatory roles. So I am delighted to be part of the function. Uh, we've got lots to do. I was asked to talk about one priority, but I heard Mary sneak a few in. Uh, so my one priority that I had put down to talk about was, of course, the work that I'm leading with the superb support of our teams across CQC in terms of maternity. So you will all be, I'm sure, aware that we are uh, uh, already in train actually with our national maternity improvement program of which one element is uh, a condensed inspection program nationally so of course my priority that i was going to talk about the next year is that all women babies families receive personalized safe and high quality maternity care and that's my ambition through the program but equally to say uh, and just sneak in one more if i may team and that is the work that we're doing to reach out to support to work with all of you in provider world uh, around innovation in the winter collaborative so we have been looking to quickly establishing and really get into grips with how we recognize innovation and how we work with you to understand the impact uh, in terms of positive outcomes and experiences for patients as a result of that innovation. So uh, good to see you. Thank you. It's me next to, to introduce Chris Tzatziki, who is our Director of Mental Health. Chris can't be with us just now, but will be with us, I believe, later on the call. He's on another call at the moment. Uh, Chris is a registered mental health nurse. Um, uh, with a lot of a huge amount of experience in healthcare transformation and, and commissioning. Chris has been working recently with NHS England in London and has joined us relatively recently. So uh, we welcome Chris in uh, into the group. Hi there, um, my name is Scott Duray-Raj. I'm the uh, Director of Integrated Care 
inequalities and improvement. Uh, I started in uh, September and uh, long history in the NHS, about 31 years starting off as a clinical paramedic and uh, went into leadership around health inequalities and inequalities uh, in a number of different roles and then into assurance uh, for NHS England. Uh, for me, really, health inequalities are the pivotal uh, priority and the new ways of working in systems and supporting the CQC to move into that innovation and improvement space are my kind of rounded piece. So I think we've got a once in a, uh, a kind of generation opportunity really to affect healthcare in a way that the World Health Organization has been recommending for a long time through integration and bringing those kind of policies together and modern ways of working together uh, in integrated care to really identify, recognise and work together on reducing health inequalities. And I think CQC moving into the innovation and improvement space there is something I'm really looking forward to. Thank you, Scott. And I'm going to take the last two um, directors, uh, colleagues who aren't able to join us today. So the first one is Debbie Ivanova. Uh, Debbie's our director for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. And Debbie's a social worker with lots of experience in um, social care and in regulation. Um, Debbie's been in this role uh, a little while, maybe for a couple of years now. And Debbie has been really focusing on how um, the market, the types of services that are available for people with learning disabilities and autistic people, that they meet people's needs, that they're community based, that they enable people to live their best lives. She's also very recently been looking at people with learning disabilities experience of hospital. We published a report uh, not that long ago called Who I Am Matters, which describes the inequalities experienced by people with learning disabilities going into acute hospital and how some of the basics just weren't in place to support them to have the, the most uh, best experience that they can. So Debbie is uh, across everything to do with um, learning disabilities. And then our final director, if we just move on to my colleague Stuart Dean. Stuart is our director of our corporate provider team and market oversight. So this is a function uh, only for the adult social care sector. It was set up back in 2015 to ensure that there is good um, planning and good oversight for those um, adult social care providers where should they um, go out of business, should they leave the sector, that there can be a kind of orderly seamless transition for those people receiving care to another provider. So I'm sure there's lots of uh, work with the providers in the market oversight scheme about their finances, about quality, and then he uses that um, information in kind of high level terms to talk to government about the pressures, particularly in the adult social care sector when it comes to money. So that's Stuart. So we're going to move on now and talk about um, ambitions. I'm watching the chat and you've already put some fabulous questions in, so please keep them coming. This is an opportunity as well as um, giving us questions to kind of react and respond to what I am saying. So as Sean said at the beginning of the webinar, um, our function is new and we've been busily spending the last six months thinking about how can we have the maximum amount of impact to ensure that people get the best quality care that they can have? Um, how can we influence to the, the kind of biggest extent possible? And we set out a set of kind of ambitions that we would like to talk to you about today. And some of these will feel very obvious to you. Others you might think, mm, is that, you know, is that your role CQC? So we'd love to hear your reflections on, on any part of that, that kind of spectrum. So um, our ambition, and probably yours as well, is that everyone uh, in England accessing health and social care gets the best possible care available to them. Um, so we've been thinking as a regulator about what we can do about making sure that, that, that we understand what the, what the conditions are for people to get the best quality care possible. But also what we should be doing with providers who aren't able to provide that best possible care. So there's something about ensuring that uh, we know when providers are struggling to provide the quality of care they would want, um, that they have access to uh, improvement support. Um, but there are a very, very, very small number of providers who, um, despite that offer of improvement support, aren't able to sustain providing care at a level that we would expect for people receiving it. What more should we as a regulator do in those 
very rare instances. So most people come into this business because they don't want they want to do a fabulous job for the people they are caring for. But there's a very small number of providers who aren't able to do that and sustain it. What more steps should we as CQC be taking with those um, those inadequate services? Love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, secondly, we've got an ambition, um, so uh, you may or may not know, I'm a social worker by background. When I was director of social services, um, we did a big piece of work around introducing co-production into how we designed services, commissioned services and evaluated the quality of those um, services. So, so co-production is in my DNA, as is it in CQCs. Um, so we, we really want to see how people are empowered to shape the services that they receive. And this can be done at a number of levels. So this can be done at the kind of individual level. How do people receiving health and social care shape the outcomes from that interaction they're having with a health or social care profession? How do they influence the, the provision they're receiving if they're living in a care home or accessing a GP? Um, up to the kind of big strategic point, how are people who are using services able to influence the kind of strategic direction of the organisation, which is a very big ambition I appreciate. Um, so our second ambition is we want to see uh, people being able to shape the quality of care they receive and our new single assessment framework that many of you may be aware of that's coming uh, in uh, in online uh, towards uh, the end of 2023 that is giving us the tools with which we will hold providers local authorities and integrated care systems to account for what matters to people who receive uh, health and social care so we're gonna our single assessment framework is about regulating through the eyes of people who use services and, and seeing how they shape shape the, the quality of care they receive. The third priority is we want to make sure that everyone gets safe care and that we regulate all parts of the health and care system. We are well aware that we have good visibility of, of the quality of care when people come into the system. Uh, we're also aware of the growing numbers of people uh, who are waiting to access a service. We know that from the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, there are about 500,000 people waiting for an assessment or waiting for care to arrive. We know there's growing numbers of people waiting for um, health or treatment from the health service. We know of people who are waiting to see their GPs and, and all other parts of the health and care landscape. You'll remember back to our, our strategy, our vision at the start of the session that not only do we want to have a view on quality when people get in through the front door of health and social care, but we want to really understand people's uh, journey to receiving that care in, in the first place. So we want to make sure that we can uh, have good visibility of the, the care, the experiences of people before they come into a regulated service, as well as once they are in through that front door. The fourth one is around improvement. So you met Scott earlier. Scott is our new director of uh, inequalities, uh, integration and improvement. Our strategy talked about us wanting to play a more active role in uh, in looking at the improvement that is available for people. So obviously integrated care systems will have a really important role to play when it comes to ensuring that people um, have the opportunity to access an improvement offer. We know an improvement offer feels very different if you're a large acute trust versus a small uh, social care provider that's maybe not part of a large infrastructure uh, with quality improvement teams, etc. So we want to do more to ensure that there is a consistent and effective improvement offer available for all, all providers out there. Um, and, and the reason why that matters so much is that the, the output of that is that we would expect to see people getting better quality care. And then the final one that you will probably have a view on um, is what role we as a regulator should pay, play in the, the kind of market. So um, this isn't completely new territory. Um, we developed a policy a number of years ago now called uh, registering the right support, and that got refreshed about a year ago uh, to a policy called right support, right care, right culture. And this was a policy about um, the services available for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. And we base this policy on the NICE guidance about what good provision should look like for that group of people. And we said that, um, uh, that we only want to be registering services that meet the requirements set out in this policy and that we will be um, uh, looking at how providers are meeting the values in that, that policy when we come out and regulate them. So in doing so, um, we set up a new team in our registration uh, service to have conversations with providers and commissioners when they're starting to think about maybe building an extra 
you know, wing onto the service they already run or building some bungalows in their in their garden. Uh, we invite providers to come and talk to us very early on uh, about their ideas about the services they want to uh, create. And we can talk through to them whether that would meet the requirements of right support, right care, right culture, and therefore be something we would register and regulate. So we have been shaping the market um, in that part of the health and care landscape uh, for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. So we've done it. Are there other parts that we should be uh, having an opinion on? So um, if we think about services for people with physical disabilities, if we think about services for people uh, who are in a mental health crisis, we sit in quite a unique position as the regulator, as in um, we're not commissioners. Um, our focus, uh, and like commissioners who always have to think about uh, balancing the budget, our focus is purely on quality and we hover over the quality of that care being provided nationally, which gives us some really good insights into the types of uh, environments, the types of conditions that are more likely to result in, in good high quality care for people. So are there other parts of the health and care landscape where we as a regulator should form a view and should um, should should take a similar approach as we've done with services for people with learning disabilities and autism and in effect uh, shape the market. So um, there are lots of other people whose jobs that is, which is why it's a question that we would love to hear your thoughts on. So those are some ideas um, and some ambitions uh, bundled in together. And we're going to move on uh, to the next slide, please. So um, I, while I'm talking, I haven't been reading the chat, but I will pause now and have a little read through. And at this point, I'm going to ask Sam, my colleague, to just start bringing out some questions that you've dropped into the chat. And I can see my colleague Chris has joined us as well. So there are a number of people uh, standing uh, side by side with me to help hopefully answer the questions and reactions you have been uh, giving to what we said so far today. So over to you, Sam. Thank you, Kate, um, and thank you everyone for all your great questions so far. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, Kate, we've had quite a few people completely agree that we've, we've all got a shared ambition to provide uh, the best quality care um, for, for people who need it. But there's also quite a few questions that recognise that all of, health and social, all, health, all of health and social care is in a really challenging position right now, and people wondering what's What's the role of CQC and the regulatory leadership team in helping bridge what can sometimes seem like a gap between our ambition to provide outstanding care and the challenges healthcare providers are facing? Thank you, Sam. So I'm going to go first and then I'm going to ask my colleagues to wave at me if they want to come in um, after. So um, so our, um, our expectations about quality um, hasn't moved. So we are here on behalf of the public and the public expect and deserve high quality care. So so I think that's important to say up front. However, people receive that care in a in a context, in a, in a very challenging uh, climate that we're currently in, and we all know it's going to get more challenging in the kind of coming weeks and months. So, so our job is to continue to hold that quality bar strong. Um, it's to recognise and call out the context that providers are having to work in. So we know the massive workforce challenges across uh, all parts of health and social care. Um, so we need to recognise the challenges. We need to um, highlight where, despite the odds, providers are still providing exceptional care. So in any part of the country, we will find providers that are still going the extra mile and delivering fabulous care for people. So we can shine a spotlight on it. We can look at what the ingredients are that, that enables that provider despite the really tough circumstances to provide um, that high quality care. We can also use the evidence we gather um, in our conversations with government, in publications we, we produce that, um, that might call out things that need to change. So um, I'm thinking a little while ago of a publication, a report we did called um, Oral Health in Care Homes. It's called Smiling Matters. And in it, we uh, did a series of inspections with dental inspectors going into care homes. And we found um, that some of the basics just weren't in situ. So we found people not having access to a toothbrush, not having an oral health care plan. But we also found a big issue with dentists not being uh, accessible for people who lived in care homes. We wrote the report, we called for a number of actions from different commissioners, um, and we now continue to look at that when we go out and, and inspect. So there are a number of things we can do while continuing to hold the bar 
firm and high about the quality of care in recognising the context, celebrating the best practice, but also using our evidence to call on government, other partners, commissioners for things that need to change um, to address the things that we are seeing. Does anyone else from the team want to come in on that? Do you want to come in, Sean? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll just come in because um, I'd just like to emphasise um, one point. I mean, when and I agree absolutely uh, with Kate's um, uh, uh, what Kate said about the, the standard of quality. We, we nobody nobody I've spoken to over the last six months to a year wants that to drop. Nobody I've spoken to in 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 provider uh, organisations wants to provide less less good quality care. So I think that when we uh, when we help organisations uh, understand where the quality of care they're offering is not uh, not at the, the standard they wish, then that that is something that that is helpful for that organisation to understand. Um, they may already know it and, and that's not a problem. Um, but if they don't, then us helping uh, organisations understand where there is a quality deficit and a quality problem is probably the first step to uh, addressing that problem. I'm not saying the problems are easy to address, they're, they're difficult often to address. Uh, and in this context, in the context we're in at the moment, they can be very difficult to address. But that doesn't mean that people haven't been successful in addressing quality issues that um, that are, are, you know, are relevant to quality. And I think um, the first step in doing that is to is to understand where where the you know where quality is suffering. I'll stop there. Thank you, Sean. Do you want to come with the next question, Sam? Yes, thanks, Kate. Thanks, Sean. Um, so we've had a, um, a few questions and kind of support for um, what some of the, our colleagues on the call have talked about in terms of raising the status of some of the sectors we regulate that might be traditionally under recognised and under represented, so particularly in adult social care and for mental health services. So there was just a couple of questions a bit asking to say a bit more about how we might do that and some of the work we could see happening that keeps the focus on those two areas. So I'll come to Mary in a second on adult social care and Chris on mental health, if, if that's OK. Um, and you would have got a flavour of Mary's passion around adult social care in the intro. And I, and I, I stand here as someone who's spent 20 years in social care and think it can be the most life enhancing, vibrantly fabulous uh, career. But there's a whole lot more we need to do. Um, as a country to ensure that it is a career of choice for people to come in and, and stay in. But um, Mary, do you want to say a bit about adult social care and then we'll, we'll go over to Chris? Yes, thanks, Kate. Yes, thanks, Kate. So um, I think there's many ways that we can contribute uh, alongside um, providers in terms of explaining um, the great work that adult social care does and how the connections work. There are many people who only encounter adult social care in a crisis and we've got um, media commentary, haven't we, that uh, in some quarters you'd think social care was all about clearing an ambulance queue, whereas in fact adult social care is about whole life, great lives and let's be clear, great deaths as well. So um, it, it's, a, it's an unrecognised and misunderstood. So we've got a voice at CQC, not, not just our annual state of care, which is of course very important, but that we are, we are proclaiming and explaining. The way that we are going to be working with our new, the new way we're organised in our operational arm with people working closely together. So still having our specialisms, but in a team, those who work with GPs, community services, acute services and adult social care working together, we'll get a real sense of how things are in a place. And I think the work that we're going to be doing, looking at um, the new ICS uh, assessments that we're working towards, that we, we I want to see that adult social care is thought of it from the start in thinking about the needs of a population in an area and is seen as part of a, a solution, not just as a reactive problem, problem solving service. So I think um, 
and of course, there's many things we do at CQC that don't get the airtime that we wish they did. But I think collectively um, explaining, promoting and celebrating um, great, great news stories and putting the focus on the joined upness of care and where it's working really well, I think, um, you know, it's not going to be an overnight um, thing to fix, is it? It's been years in the making, but um, let's I'm determined it won't be years in the solving. And I, I look to help from the sector as well, because I think if we join up and do this together, then we increase our chances of success, don't we? Thanks. Thanks, Mary. And welcome, Chris. Sean intro to you. Um, so if you just want to say who you are and maybe say a bit about what you think that can be done to kind of raise the profile of mental health services. Amazing. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Zikiti, um and uh, um, Director of uh, Mental Health here at CQC. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question, isn't it? Um, and, and for me, uh, I'm a mental health nurse by background and uh, absolutely passionate about mental health and uh, everything that we do in that space. And, and for me, mental health has never been important than now with everything that we have been through for the past uh, two to three years with the pandemic and mental health, it's now a priority for everyone. And, and for us, it's trying to keep on making sure actually mental health is on the agenda for everyone. That is everyone's responsibility when it comes to, to mental health. And seconding what uh, uh, my colleague was just talking about in terms of actually when we work with ICS and ICBs, as they mature to become you know, those boards, how do we make sure mental health is not uh, an afterthought? How do we continuously advocate for mental health to be given the same uh, attention as physical health. And when we talk about parity of esteem, how do we make sure actually it's a reality for, for, for everyone? I mean, the other thing to think about is how do we continuously influence other key stakeholders to think about the work they are doing and to make sure actually mental health is not forgotten in some of the work. The last thing I'll say obviously is around, I always think about when people are talking about elective care, they seem to think about you know the acute care pathway. And for me, I'm thinking elective care, it should include mental health because elective care, we're just talking about the work we do in healthcare, and that should also include mental health. So I think, I think there is room to continuously, you know, inspire, advocate for mental health. And that's what we'll continuously do within CQC to make sure actually those people then we end up uh, receiving mental health services, they are receiving the best care possible because we continuously advocate for mental health in every space, in every conversation we have. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next question, please, Sam. Thanks, Kate. So one of the things we've had quite a positive call for in the questions is to look at uh, people's pathways through, through and across systems. So and the value of doing that for particular groups of people as well who may have challenge accessing parts of the system or moving between it. So um, attached to that was a bit of a question about how much will we focus on that in the future? And is, is this something people can see CQC talking about more over the next few years? So absolutely. And over to Scott. Do you want to talk a bit about your ambition, Scott? Yeah, thank you. And uh, this is almost the perfect question uh, for the session, actually, because we we're talking about improvements and people's experience. This has been the challenge of the more steps people have uh, during the care, the more likely errors are to occur, the more likely uh, care sometimes fails or people are missed out and access and experience can be reduced. So I know because uh, I've worked uh, directly in ICBs very recently, uh, this is the big piece of work that everybody's trying to look at and trying to understand, understanding how can we improve pathways. This is really important when we come to workforce, and I know there's some comments here about workforce. By having more streamlined and more um, uh, joined up uh, pathways, you means the workforce can also be flexible during these times where we have high levels of vacancies and challenges in that space. But more, most of all is, of course, for patients to navigate what is becoming slightly more complex care and complex pathways, but they don't need to be from a patient perspective. And this is where those commissioners coming closer uh, in partnerships, in systems with their populations and their needs is really critical. And there are some really good examples in places like uh, Surrey Heartlands and in Sussex, where those uh, kind of commissioning decisions and 
designs are really linking to those patient needs at place and bringing in local authority colleagues within that as well. Um, but also recognising some of the challenges, for instance, on cancer pathways where patients from the poorest communities might get referred to a hospital in London from Sussex and that train fare is going to cost them £70. And if there's no understanding there around which of these postcodes belong to those deprived communities, then some of those really well aligned pathways that deliver excellent care can fail just from that lack of thought. CQC in the assessment process, but also part of our improvement pathway, we need to be part of that solution. And if we've got intelligence from one part of the country, we've got a real big role in spreading and sharing that rapidly through the 42 ICSs. It's much easier to do it through 42 organisations that speak for partnerships than it is trying to do it through 240 individual organisations. So again, just moving and modernising the way we work and working with ICBs in, in that way and in that thinking as well, I think is going to be critical. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next question, Sam. Thanks, Kate. Um, so there's there's been a few questions about what we see as um, CQC's role in um, sharing best practice or kind of facilitating the sharing of best practice across systems, either between providers or between different parts of the system and, and providers. I'm just wondering, um, uh, Victoria, so uh, there, there's also been a couple of questions about our approach to our maternity inspection. So, um, Victoria, I think it's really important that there is a balanced story about what we're seeing out there in maternity care. And I just wonder whether you wanted to say a bit more about our programme of inspections, but also some gems in terms of the good practice that's that you're seeing, as well as the areas that need to improve. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I think th there's quite a few threads in the in the chat that I could link uh, to the to the maternity program. So just to pull out another one, because I'm hoping it will touch them all. Is I think it's the most liked comment, but you know that kind of real grounding of regulation and how is it reflective of the workforce and the workforce experience at the moment. So again, to use maternity. So. Um, what we're doing and we will learn what we uh, how impactful it is but what we're doing in our maternity national program is very much shaping and steering our approach as a result of reaching out to hear a number of different voices significantly the voices of the workforce so um, earlier this year we called together it was hundreds in the end of frontline maternity professionals not just midwives but clinicians and other support functions but in a come and talk to us come and talk to us in, in a non-trust specific way come and talk to us about the challenges the pressures what it feels like to truly be on the front line delivering maternity care and equally how can we what is it that we can do through our regulatory approach to zoom in uh, on that how well supported you are as the frontline professionals and and how the trust can work with you to get the best from uh, and for you as a workforce as well as women uh, and, and babies as well. So the voice of the workforce, the voice of women, partners, carers and families, something that we really, really went um, and invested in significantly over the summer into the autumn to shape our current targeted focused approach. Uh, and that focused approach is that we will visit every single maternity service that we've not seen since April 2021. Now, that means we can do two things. Of course, as the regulator, we need to ensure those fundamental standards of care for women, babies and families. So we will ensure uh, and, and take action if we need to to ensure that baseline. But importantly, through this programme, we are able to and actively looking to find the creativity the innovations, the excellence of best practice that's resulting in best experiences, again, not just for women, babies, families, but for the frontline workforce. We know that everybody is going to work every single day to work hard uh, and doing their best uh, every single day. And we want to draw out the best of how that's working, how with the staff, because we know the staffing pressures, we get that. But with the staff that are available on any given shift of any given week, how is the service, how is the trust around, the system around supporting the service to be safe, high quality and effective for the women and babies in their care at any one time? And we're really working really hard. We're open to listening. We might have, we will have more of those roundtable events and we really want to shape regulation in a way that works for the workforce. We understand the staffing pressures and we're really trying to dive deep through this programme to get not just the best from women, babies, families, but as I say, for the workforce. So yeah, keep talking to us, keep shaping us, because so far the early indicators are we're going to be able to share some of that best practice soon, early next year. Thank, Thank you. Victoria. Uh, Sam? 
Thanks both. Um, so I think we, we may have already mentioned this a bit in some of our responses, but we've had quite a lot of questions highlighting the particular challenge around workforces at the moment and recruiting and retaining staff. So I wonder if we could say a bit more about our role in continuing to highlight that issue and working with others to find um, solutions to the challenge. Thanks Scott, do you want to come in first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. Yeah, I think um, workforce, as I, I highlighted briefly, you know, frontline operationally, both in health and care, is the big challenge uh, that's facing the systems. And that creativity and the partnership uh, within NHS is, is a big part of it. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of challenges this winter coming um, uh, for our colleagues in, in health and care at, at the frontline. And so I think there's a number of things that we have to do uh, in the CQC and in that innovation and improvement piece is, is going to be critical to that. So where we see systems uh, who are coming up with creative solutions to that, rapidly sharing that information, making it easier to make those um, staffing uh, safe, uh, but also uh, innovative, I think is critical. I think there's challenges with um, also, you know, in certain parts of the country, in more rurality, they they are struggling. And I know the trusts that sit just outside the London boundaries because of the pay differentials also struggle. So again, we just need to consider that when we're looking at organisations and thinking about when we see really effective workforce strategies that are built across a system, not single providers. And I think that's where our mindset really does need to, to move and the integrated care assessments will help um, us move into that position as well as uh, support those systems who are already doing it and those systems that do need to do that. So I think the workforce challenge is well recognised both in, in health and of course social care. We, we all, I think there's lots of chat about the social care challenge and we know that without that the NHS doesn't really stand by itself at all. Uh, so we need to be more creative in that and again there's been some good examples with staff networks for instance from uh and, and in Sussex where I was previously working in the ICB the black staff network from uh social care were included within the NHS and that, that was really an interesting support cycle through the uh through the pandemic and an important part of that piece of work so again there are examples out there but I think we we need to move into that space Thank you, Scott. And Sam, if I can just jump in uh, with a, a question, just reading through. Mary, there's a bit of a theme about when are we going to assure local authorities? What will that look like? Lots of chat about how local authority commissioning practice impacts on providers' ability to deliver um, the kind of high quality care they, they want to. So do you want to say just a little bit about what our role um, is likely to look like with local authorities in, in 23? Thank you, Kate. Yes, very happy to. Uh, so we're working hard to develop our approach to local authorities. We're expecting to get the powers um, for assessment from probably April next year. Uh, the single assessment framework that's being referred to is, is what we're basing um, that assessment on. And the response of it, what we've been asked to do is to assess local authorities in their delivery of their Care Act responsibilities. So this is everything from uh, the responsibility to prevent um, the need for care for as long as possible. So those proactive preventative services, the need to provide a range of good quality information for people and carers, and then there to be a range of um, good high quality services to choose from when that's needed. Now, I've been around long enough to remember a version of this, a very different version of this, that a predecessor organisation to CQC had responsibility for. But this is an area that hasn't really been subject to our regulation or indeed any regulation for sort of the last 12 years. So we've um, we have had a couple of um, test and learn exercises in Hampshire and Manchester over over the summer. Uh, so finding our feet. So we will be looking at um, the, the uh, how well uh, the need for services is understood and how they're provided. Now, uh, 
two huge elements of this will be feedback from providers. We want to know from providers their experience of working um, in and with a local authority and of course carers and people using services and indeed from staff working in a local authority and to use all that together to uh, to reach a view. Um, the final decision on whether we're going to rate local authorities um, in the way that we rate providers will be taken by the Secretary of State, but we're geared up to do that if that's the ask that's made of us. Um, there are concerns, of course, some of which have been reflected in the questions I've been reading about times being really tough and is this the right time? But from my perspective, um, having information about what it's really like for local authorities seeking to commission and provide these services, for providers who are commissioned and for people receiving the service and for those working in those services, that, that's a good thing. So I'm really looking forward to this, um, throwing some, some light um, into what's going on and with the focus, of course, on improvement. Um, so that, that's we're gearing up to start and we've uh, we've been working with people like ADAS and the Local Government Association. We're very much building this in co-production with people and um, I, I'm really I'm really confident that it will add a lot to the national debate and be a driver for improvement. But it, it is going to be a, 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 a big change, but we're, we're approaching it carefully and proportionately and in consultation with others. So I'm excited to start when we when we do that sometime next year. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Should we take a couple more questions, Sam, and then we'll, we'll draw this to a close. Thanks, Kate. Um, so we've got quite strong support for our focus on on inequalities which I'm sure Scott will be pleased to hear about um, and some particular questions about the role we could play in um, I guess raising the voice of people who, who aren't maybe normally heard uh, their experiences aren't normally heard and supporting providers to better engage with some of those communities as well. Thanks do you want to come in Scott? Yeah, thank you. And uh, again, this is um, a perfect question. It feels like I've got all my friends and family on the call, but I, I assure you I haven't. Um, yeah, this is this is a, a sign that we are moving to really get this bit of inequalities. And, you know, inequalities are pervasive. They've been around for some time. And, um, you know, it's not what Bevan set up the healthcare system to do. And it's not what we're actually delivering successfully in, in those reductions. And we have seen for the first time some some of those life expectancy gaps widening for certain groups. Um, the pandemic didn't shine a light on health inequalities because those people who live with them are scarred with them every day, but I think they did bring them to the fore for many people. Um, I think we've got a real role here working with our partners like NHS England on and BOLA on health inequalities uh, on the core 20 plus five to make that make kind of sense to people at every level through the system and every partner both in local authority and in the voluntary community sector we need to make sure that every one of our inspectors understands what that looks like for both place and neighborhood and also of course for our providers that they can talk with uh, a level of conviction around what their system have agreed on their core 20 plus 5 and what do those changes in both access experience and outcomes look like it's not that difficult but it is a mindset change um, and, and it is a focus and a serious knowledge need in many systems and many places but absolutely critical we get this right the marginalization of some groups and the disadvantage for some groups whether it be people with learning disabilities certain ethnic minority groups uh, the people born deaf etc the face in just basic access and basic care really can't go on and it is a piece that we're looking to ensure that both in provider inspections but also in the assessments for integrated care we are making sure in those spaces that there's a good level of understanding and knowledge throughout uh, system uh, place and neighborhood thank you scott so we may have time for one more sam if it's a quick one is there a, is there a quick one that jumps out at you um if not i will draw this to a, a close um yes i i mean i think 
this hopefully is uh, quite a quick answer, but I guess just a, a bit of a question from some people who recognise there are other national organisations that are developing improvement offers and a voice about quality on, on a national level. And I guess people just looking for a guarantee that we're not looking to duplicate any of us work and we'll, we'll work in partnership to support organisations like NHS England, um, Social Care Institute for Excellence, etc. So, so as you say, that's a that's a good question and, a, and an easy answer, which is absolutely so. The work Scott and his team have been doing to think about how we will assure um, the work of integrated care systems, the work Mary's been doing around how we assure the work of local authorities are absolutely being done hand in glove with uh, NHS England, with local government, um, etc. So, so, um, so that's a that's a firm yes. So, thank you for, for that question. Um, so um, there have been many uh, other questions in the chat that we've not been able to get to today. So sorry if we haven't had a chance to uh, respond. Um, your feedback will not be lost, so our team will make sure that we've captured your reflections and comments um, in the chat and we will have a chance to, to digest on, on that um, after. So thank you so much for your active um, involvement. Um, next step, so there's a lot of new things that are going to be coming in during uh, 2023. We will be going live with our new um, approach to our single assessment framework for providers. We've got our new powers going live with local authorities and integrated care systems and then we've got the continuation of really important work for programmes like Victoria's maternity inspections and the work that Chris is leading around um, observational inspections of, of mental health uh, settings where, where people live. So a lot of activity that we uh, will be providing leadership on. We will be celebrating best practice, calling out areas where we think uh, they need to um, improve and, and con continuing to work in partnership with you all as providers and with people who use services and other stakeholders to um, refine our, 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 our approach. So a uh, busy year uh, coming up in 2023. Um, next couple of slides are just a reminder about how to uh, stay in touch. So if you're happy to whip us on. Um, thank you, Steph. So a reminder that our Citizens Lab platform is our online interactive way of getting involved in shaping ideas as we uh, develop them. We've got our provider bulletin and blogs, um, Twitter accounts, and we're also regularly uh, publishing uh, podcasts. So, so make sure you are signed up um, to them. So my final minutes, I think there might be one final slide. It's a thank you slide um, just because it's too good an opportunity with you know around 3000 of you on the call for me and the rest of our regulatory leadership gang here at CQC to say a massive thank you for the hard work and graft you put in day in, day out, um, ensuring that people get the, the quality of care that we would all want. Um, it's been a tough year on the back of a number of tough years and we're about to go into winter. So none of us are sitting here um, not recognising the full kind of weight and the challenge ahead of you all but we just want to say a massive thank you for your um, efforts thank you for coming along today um, and engaging with us and I hope that you get a little bit of respite at some point um, around Christmas time um, uh, to kind of refresh and regroup ready for what will be no doubt a busy 2023 so a big thank you and on that note we will finish the webinar thanks colleagues